Warning, this is an extreme noob video. We are so aware that lots of our, um, lots of the people who watch our videos, uh, some of them are experienced growers, some of you are just learning about carnivorous plants for the very first time, and some of you might never grow one of these things ever, but just like looking at ours and learning about what we do here at the farm. So if you're a uh, crazy Nepenthes guy who's got, already got a grow tent in your closet full of these things and you know what mountain they all came from, probably tune out now. But this is going to be just a general, you know, how does the Nepenthes grow? What are they made of, kind of? And, you know, how do we keep them looking nice? So right here, I have this Nepenthes ventricosa. That's a very easy to grow, basic species from the Philippines. Nepenthes ventricosa was like, perhaps be the first Nepenthes I've ever grown. Um, it's very often the first Nepenthes that people grow. Uh, and it's looking very just typical here today. And so I thought it'd be a really good um, example of how these things grow. So tropical pitcher plants, Nepenthes, are vining plants. Um, how that progresses is, you know, you'd have a small plant down here, and then as it's growing, it's mostly going to have kind of tight nodes, especially of intracosa. The nodes are always pretty tight, but it's going to be kind of tight little nodes, which is the space between the leaves on the stem, and just throwing new little leaves, new little pitchers at the end, until it makes kind of like a rounded merry-go-round of pitchers. And then at a certain point when it gets enough energy, it's going to head for that canopy in the jungle and start to vine. And that's when these nodes start to stretch out. You can see on this plant, it started down here. You know, every vine is just an old basal shoot. So this guy, a long time ago, was down here, just like this shoot was, and it's been growing, going, going. Nepenthes can vine uh, for feet, tens of feet. I don't know what the record is, but they vine all over the jungle. Um, many times they're trying to get higher up into the trees where they produce upper pitchers. All Nepenthes have lower and upper pitchers. And you might see that like on the forums and you're like, what does that mean? Like a lower pitcher, and upper pitcher? So pitchers that are produced low down on the basal shoots, those are going to be lower. Unfortunately, this one doesn't have it open, but it's just opening it up here. You can see it's going to be much more colorful. Um, usually they are bigger because they can rest down there on the moss or on the ground. Um, and they usually have Ventricosa doesn't have this, but they usually have frilled little wings that go down the front of the pitcher that encourage crawling insects to climb their way up like a ladder up into the pitcher. As they grow higher onto the vine, they will slowly transition. And these were probably like what we would call intermediate pitchers. So they're kind of in between the lower pitchers and the upper pitchers. And then up here, they'll start to make what would be true lower pitchers, I mean upper pitchers. <laughs> So these upper pitchers are creamy white and not red. The tendril that the pitcher hangs off presents from the back instead of from the front or the side like it does down there. It's another interesting difference. And although ventricosa never has wings, the upper pitchers absolutely don't have those little ladders for uh, crawling insects. And what's interesting about that is the upper pitchers are evolved to catch flying insects up here. And the lower pitchers are evolved to catch low, uh, crawling bugs down there, which is just so cool because every single Nepenthe species, almost every single one, has upper and lower pitchers, that dual strategy of hunting. And that's what we're talking about. Lower pitchers down here, upper pitchers up. It's pretty basic, but I thought I'd explain it. Um, when we're talking about leaves, you know, people will often refer to these as the leaves. And they're leafish, for sure, but technically, botanically, not a leaf. If I turn it over here, you'll see a pretty pronounced ridge. That's actually the stem or petiole of the leaf. Um, it's winged out like this to look like a leaf because the actual leaf is the pitcher. So that's the actual leaf. So if this was a maple leaf, this would be the little stem at the bottom, this whole thing. And then the fanned out part, that would actually be this pitcher. And believe it or not, it's evolved over millennia to slowly wrap around and fill with digestive fluid somehow to modify from a typical leaf into this. And as that transition happened, as that evolution progressed, this petiole, the stem of the leaf, flattened out to photosynthesize because this is no longer very good at photosynthesis. And photosynthesis is taking light and turning it into sugar, which is how all plants, even carnivorous plants, make their sugars. So as they evolved to catching insects with these, 
they had to evolve something to photosynthesize, and that's this flattened leaf. Ah, uh, sorry, patio. <laughs> the terminology of, with botany is so tricky. It's really so jargony, but not too intimidating, especially when you dive in there. And then this little corn cob at the top is a flower. Um, with the exception of uh, plants like Campanulata, maybe Truncata, they're going to need to put a lot of vine on before they make a flower. Flowers are never coming off of basal shoots down here. They're just not. Um, like I said, there's some plants where they don't really make much vining, and so it can look like a basal thing is flowering, like Campanulata. Even Truncata is going to put some stem on. Um, but this is probably the minimum amount of stem that you would need to get on there, which is probably two or three feet, before you can expect to see a flower. Uh, this is a male flower. Something else that's interesting about Nepenthes is unlike every other carnivorous plant, which has male and female parts on the same flower, think about that for a second, <laughs> these guys have only male flowers or only female flowers. And I always say with biology, never say never, never say always, because every now and then, one of these male flowers will throw a female flower, um, and vice versa. We've even seen like really weird, like kind of like combo female male flowers, and everybody knows what they're doing. But in biology, it is you know a continuum of all kinds of different fractal changing, mutating traits at all times, and so it's not nearly as cut and dry as lots of people think it is. These are not open flowers yet. But in a second, these little round balls will pop open and there'll be a little yellow dab of um, pollen on there. And that's how you'll know it's male. Female flowers don't have pollen. Pollen's a male flower thing. So that'll be a male flower eventually. And then, as you can see, the growth point, which all the life of an Epinthes lives in these growth points and in their lateral buds. So as this flowers, it's already pushing this new growth point to the side. It's going to grow past that and continue to vine on. But they also have lateral buds. Lateral buds, lateral means the side, buds, we think we all know what that means. And lateral buds are actually just above every single, every single petiole. There's a um, dormant bud. You can see that one just waking up, probably because of the flower. But there's also one down here. You can probably see a tiny little bump at the end of my dirty fingernail there. <laughs> Never trust a gardener with clean hands. Um, but those are all little buds and can potentially be new growth points. How do we get those to break? We get those to break by cutting this whole thing off. There's a hormone that's coming from this growth point that is suppressing the breaking of the buds. And as it grows away, that concentration gets weaker and it will allow some of these buds to break down here. But if you want to break all of them, or at least the top two or three, the best, easiest way to do that is to chop this top one off. Obviously, if you take the tip off, there is no more hormone concentration inhibiting bud breaking, and it needs to grow a new top, and the plant knows that. And so these top two or three buds will all break at the same time and create a bushier plant for you, because that means there'll be three growth points coming here, all making um, sets of pitchers, and so that'll often give you like three times as many pitchers. So you can create bushier plants if you chop them back. And if this thing is vining all over your kitchen window and it's like knocking your knickknacks over and dripping nectar all over everything, this is your plant. You can totally chop it back. It's totally capable of taking that damage. Um, so don't be shy. You can chop it back. I could, I'm not going to do it right now, but I could totally just take these scissors, pop that off right there, just to, and then these buds will all start growing and I'll have a bushier plant for my window, which is cool if that's what you want. You can also root that thing. So I could chop this off, I could cut these leaves off, we've done videos about it before, we'll do more videos in the future. But you could also root the end of that and make a new plant and give it to your friend. You could also cut off these basal shoots. Um, well, what you could also do is you cut this whole thing off right here. See this whole vine? And it's interesting here, see how that's brown? Don't freak out about that. The old vine on Nepenthes is almost always brown like that. That's totally healthy. That's how they look in the wild. That's how they look here under professionally maintained conditions. Like, don't freak out about the brown stem. Even if I send you a small plant, it's probably going to have a brown stem if you look down there. Don't freak out about that. It's totally fine. Even the expensive Edwardsiana that you paid $500 for. Thank you for that. Uh, 
And I know they're special, so you're looking at them extra super hard. I do too. But those little brown stems, totally normal. Don't worry about that, even if it's rare, even if it's expensive. Um, and then you can cut this whole thing off. So I could cut that brown part there, get rid of this whole long vine, go away. And then all this energy that was in here will start pushing into there. And you'll get really big lower pitchers much faster. Um, just this will all explode down here if you chop all that off. So you could do that. Another thing you could do if you wanted to keep it vining, but you didn't really want these down here for some reason, or you wanted to trade this Ventricosa with a friend and say, so even eyeing it, when can I cut this off to make a new one to root to send to my friend so I can get this other plant I want? Well, you can cut this off and root this basil. So this is the basil shoot. This is the vining plant. And in the Nepenthes world, you'll see a lot of Nepenthes guys going you know, like, you know, can I get that? Can I get that basil bra? Can I root that? Can I root that basil? When do I root that basil? You're gonna rent that. You can probably do it right about here. I would let it go even a little bit longer. There's not gonna be any big awards for doing it sooner. I mean, maybe you'll get that trade plant a little bit faster, but be patient. Plants are a patient game. So I'm just going to let that keep growing probably a little bit more, but you at least want to get it to there. And then you could come in as close as the plant as possible and cut right there and then root that. So you could root this basil if you wanted to. I generally would prefer to cut away the upper things and let the basils um, take all that energy because generally the lower pictures are be more beautiful, more interesting, and it just keeps a more compact, compact plant. And you could also chop this whole thing up. Every two or three nodes is a potential new plant. So you could chop it every three leaves and make probably 10 cuttings out of this and leave those basils as opposed to cutting that um, and ending up with this kind of sprawly plant. So this is your plant. The choice is yours. Cut off whatever you want. Leave whatever you want. It'll grow around that. Um, but yeah, you could totally root that. You could root that. And you can root these pieces in between. I don't think there's too much more to talk about on these guys. We could swing over really quick just to see an old female flower since I see it right here. This is a female flower that's a little bit past. You can tell by these ends, these little platforms is where the pollen would go from a male flower. And when they're brown like that, that means they're not receptive anymore. So those are just like old seed pods that aren't going to work out. If they were going to make seeds, the seeds would be inside these little guys. Because they were not pollinated, they're still really small, and there's really nothing in there. But if I had pollinated them, these would have swollen up to being like three or four times as long, and they'd be all full of seeds. Oh, I forgot for these Nepenthes vines. Vining plants, everyone. Um, another phenomenon for new people is when those non-fertilized, non-pollinated um, female flower pods open up, they will be full of these tiny, tiny, scrummy little seeds. And you may think those are seeds. They're not. Um, I think Peter came up with this, or some other um, old horticulturist came up with the idea of dummy seeds. The fool's gold of carnivorous plants are Nepenthes dummy seeds. So um, if you didn't pollinate it and you don't have another male thing, even if there's little scrummy little things inside those pods, those probably aren't seeds. You want there to be, they should be pretty long in most cases. Sometimes they're shorter, but they should be pretty long. And there should be a little swelling in the middle of them uh, that says, ah, oh, this is probably a seed versus dummy seeds, which are very fine, very thin, and they're definitely not. Anyways, I hope you really enjoyed Nepenthe School 101, what they are, what they look like. Um, I guess another thing I could talk about real quick before I cut you loose is just trimming them because we get those questions a lot. Like, how do I trim this? I don't want to hurt it. Um, so, pictures like that, even though they're brown on top, if there was like an osmocote pellet or a bug in there, that tissue is still living. And so, it can totally still be adding to the plant. Um, so if you want really big pictures, you can leave all these on here with their little fertilizer pellet in there to feed the plant. But if you're just a persnickety person and your friends are coming over and you don't want them to be like, what is that thing in your window? You can totally clean these all off. And I cut the pictures right here at the tendril where it meets the petiole there. And that's a really great clean spot to cut it. Yep, watch out, they'll slime you. Yeah. And so you can cut all these off. 
put them in the compost, and that'll clean it up. Now down here, we have these going. These are the petioles, and now they're starting to go brown. So where do I cut those? Those you can cut right at the stem. Let's see if Janelle can get in there. And I'm just going to cut all of these off right at the stem of the plant, like that. They kind of, Careful not to cut the stem. It will happen to you if you grow these plants for a long time. It happens to everybody here at least once. I've done this many, many times over the years I've done this. We're careful, but every now and then you're going to be like, oops, and then this whole thing will fall off. And that's going to be a shocking moment for you. But that's just a learning moment. You can totally handle that. Don't freak out. Don't freak out. And you can even cut these yellow ones away. So, like, when should I cut them away? Well, you don't like them anymore. <laughs> so, if you don't like the way these yellow ones look, cut those away too. Who cares? The plant will totally grow around what you do. Just think of a bonsai and how tortured those poor things are. This is nothing compared to bonsai. And you could probably even bonsai into pimpies if you really wanted to. So, just really quickly, you can trim all that off. Maybe I'll get that guy too. And that's already looking like a lot neater and a lot better for you persnickety people. For you less persnickety people. Nobody does this in the wild. You don't have to do this. Don't worry about it. But that does look a little bit nicer now that it's all cleaned up. Anyways, Nepenthes 101. Hope you enjoyed yourself. We'll be doing more of these videos too. Just kind of basics about like what these plants do and what they're made of.